If you were hunted down by a bloodthirsty lion who won't stop until all humans are dead, what would you do? I'm going to break down the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to beat the serial killer lion in Beast. These poachers are about to be slaughtered. The hunters quietly sneak up on a pride of lions distracted by a trap and immediately fire on the pack. But there's a problem. One of these animals got away and some of the hunters go out to find him, but that was their biggest mistake. Looking around, this guy discovers a paw print in the sand and calls out to his partner, realizing too late the man has disappeared. Meanwhile, the rest of the poachers put the dead lions in their truck and drive away, leaving their teammates behind. Suddenly, this guy hears one of his friends screaming in the distance and walks into the bush to check it out. But as he's investigating, a hunter stumbles out of the darkness. His face is bleeding from vicious wounds, and it's clear he was attacked by a wild animal. Terrified, the other guy tries to run away, but steps right into a snare trap. Lifted up into the air, there's nothing the man can do to defend himself from a bloodthirsty lion that's on a mission to exterminate every human it can find. The next morning, Nate here wakes up his daughters and tells them that they're about to land. He's taken his family to the hometown of his wife, who's passed away, and are going on a safari as a way to remember her. They wait at the airport to be picked up when a car stops in the parking lot and a man steps out of the vehicle. It's their family friend, Martin, and the guy takes them to his home, explaining on his way there that he's a ranger. It's his job to protect the animals from poachers in the nearby wildlife reserve, but they have no idea that they'll soon be fighting for their lives against the king of the jungle. The next morning, Martin tells the dad that he'll be taking them on a private safari of the park where they won't run into tourists. They head out in the car, passing through the African landscape, and the ranger points out an old schoolhouse in the distance. His partner, Banji, should be nearby, and he stops the car so he can introduce the family to his fellow ranger. Getting out of the vehicle, the group sees a pack of lions in the distance, and Banji reassures them they're safe since his friend raised the males when they were cubs. The lions won't attack them unless a male enters their territory, and the ranger carefully walks towards the pride so he can check on them. The animals are glad to see Martin again, but then he notices that something's wrong. One of the lion's paws have been injured, and he tries to get closer to look at the bullet wound, but he's pushed away by another lion. Going back to the cars, the man explains to the family that poachers must have found the pride and shot at the lioness. He needs to find out if anyone saw them, and insists they stop at a nearby village to ask the locals some questions. The group agrees to go along, with no idea that they're about to walk into a massacre. Okay, this is bad news. These rangers just discovered a bullet wound in one of the lion's paws, and that means everyone here is in serious danger. It might not seem like a big deal, but South Africa is the poaching capital of the world, with thousands of animals slaughtered every month, but there's something nobody is realizing. What's suspicious is that normally, a hunter would be going after rhinoceroses and elephants for their horns and tusks, because these are the most valuable items on the black market. A rhino horn can easily go for $20,000 per kilogram, and when a single horn can weigh up to three kilos, you can make an absolute killing in this business. The truth is that lions have significantly less value, but are some of the easiest animals to kill in the wild. All you need to do is snag an antelope before poisoning the carcass with pesticide to lure a nearby lion and kill it. The fact that these poachers are shooting them instead of using traps means that they're bloodthirsty and willing to hunt more dangerous game for the thrill. With that in mind, they'd have no problem killing anyone who stands in their way, and it just so happens a ranger is killed every week by poachers. The fewer there are, the easier it is for criminals to hunt, and if Martin knew this, then he'd realize their lives might already be in danger. Now, if you look at their environment, it's painfully obvious that this is already the perfect situation for an ambush. They're surrounded by mountain ranges which block all radio signals, and nobody knows they're out there, so they're extremely vulnerable to an attack. Right now, we seem to have one tranquilizer gun and a knife, but the guests are completely inexperienced in this environment, and since the poachers outnumber them, there's no chance we would survive a confrontation. A wounded lion means they're probably going to come back to finish the job, and that's why if it were me, I would turn around and take the family home right away before it's too late. Now, we still want to protect these lions, and if these poachers aren't stopped, they'll grow in number until there are too many to control. Luckily, there's a great way to do that, because since 2013, the University of Maryland has developed algorithms to predict animal movements in wildlife parks. What's interesting is that rangers have used this data to fly drones to vulnerable areas and catch poachers red-handed. Now, this isn't as easy as it sounds, because Cougar National Park is roughly the size of New Jersey. It's way too big to fly drones and randomly hope to find poachers by chance. This is why the algorithms are so important, because based on their models, they can predict with 90% certainty where a group of animals are likely to be. 
For example, the algorithms also observed that nearly every poaching incident happened within 160 meters of a road. And if Martin here had been using these models to protect the lions, it's very likely the poachers would already have been caught. Heading to the village, Martin explains that poachers have been hunting down the lions to sell in the black market, but Nora remembers hearing that some rangers even killed the poachers caught in the reserve. Curious, she asks him if he's an anti-poacher, but the man only tells her that he keeps the animals safe. Later, the group arrives at the village, and Martin warns them to be polite with the locals, but as they walk to the town center, they find it abandoned. The ranger tries calling out, but gets no response. It's like everyone in the village left in a hurry, and the girls look around to see if there are any clues. Worried, the father suggests they should leave, when suddenly his friend warns him to keep his daughters away from the hut. The man sounds terrified, and the father tells the girls to stay where they are before joining his friend inside. As Nate walks in, he's shocked to find a group of dead villagers, and it's clear these people were murdered by a lion, but it doesn't make sense. Big cats don't usually kill people, and the ranger tells the dad they need to get out of here now, suspecting the beast is nearby. Leaving the hut, the man notices his youngest daughter is missing, and asks Mare here where she went, but the girl doesn't know. He desperately starts looking around and calls out to her when he suddenly hears Nora screaming in the distance. Following the girl's voice, the dad quickly runs into an animal pen and finds her standing in shock, horrified by a woman's dead body. The group quickly drives out of the village, and the ranger tries contacting his partner, but it's useless. The nearby mountain is blocking radio signals, so they can't call anyone for help and have no choice but to head to the nearest outpost. The daughters beg them to go home, but the man makes it clear that he has to make sure no more villagers are harmed. That's when they spot someone running onto the road, and the ranger quickly stops the car so he can go check on him. The father joins him, volunteering to help, and they find out he's a villager who had gone out to hunt down the line with his friends. It killed the others, and he's now the only survivor left. Suddenly, Martin hears something move in the grass, and immediately gets to his feet, insisting his friend go back to the car. The lion could be anywhere, and he runs over to the vehicle, telling his daughters to use the radio and call for help. The man quickly grabs some gauze from a first aid kit, and goes back to the injured villager, terrified the lion might be hiding in the grass. After examining his condition, the father starts doing chest compressions to bring him back, but it's too late. He's died from his injuries, and the family has no idea that they're about to be attacked. Okay, this is terrifying. Right now, they can't call for help, and there's a lion nearby that single-handedly mauled an entire village to death. With this in mind, there's absolutely no reason anyone should be outside of the car. Even with a gun, venturing out to look for the beast is a death sentence because this is his territory, and it gives the lion a huge advantage. Now, having said that, we should still try our best to help this villager, but Nate here is already doing a terrible job. First of all, there's no point helping the man in the middle of the road if they're both about to be attacked by a lion. The smartest approach here is to bring him inside the vehicle where he can treat his wound safely, while they continue driving out of the national park. We know that there's a first aid kit in the trunk, and they would have had a much better chance of saving the man's life. The second problem is that the father butchered his CPR technique. Now, I'm no doctor, but you're supposed to do 30 chest compressions at a rate of 110 beats per minute. Nate here is giving the villager 9 compressions in 8 seconds, and it probably means that he should return his medical certificate. Now, when it comes to this lion, there are a few terrifying observations to make here. First of all, it's important to point out that in Africa, humans and lions have been living in close proximity to each other for thousands of years, meaning these communities are very experienced in dealing with predators. What's terrifying is that this lion has not only completely outsmarted these people, but also hunted every single human in the entire village. Lions just don't do this, and that means we're dealing with a creature that is a lot less predictable. It's also worth pointing out that there aren't any scavenger animals around like hyenas or vultures, and this usually is a very clear sign that the predator is still nearby. Normally, the best way to survive a lion attack is actually to stand your ground and make as much threatening noise as possible to look intimidating. Most of the time, when a lion runs up at you, it's actually doing something called a mock charge, and if you flinch or run, it knows you are a weaker opponent. This conventional wisdom is most likely the reason why everyone in this village is dead, because they're dealing with a beast that is defying its own natural behavior. That's why if I were this ranger, I would actually try to think like a poacher and lure it towards us so that we can kill it. The best way to do this is to go back to the village and butcher the meat from this dead cow. It's unlikely they have anything around to poison it with, but if we can lure it out of hiding to eat the meat and climb a tree to stay hidden from the lion's view, we can use our tranquilizer gun and hit it with as many darts as possible to take the beast down. Meanwhile, the ranger sneaks through the trees and searches for the lion, but he's scared. One wrong move could get him killed, and the man cautiously makes his way near a lake when he spots a paw print in the mud. It must be nearby, and that's when he hears a growl in the distance. 
distance. Stepping into the water, he searches for the lion but doesn't realize it's right behind him until the last second. On the road, the father is worried about his friend when he suddenly hears a gunshot and decides to go check it out. Getting closer to the tree line, he spots something in the distance and immediately runs for his life. The man heads back to the road and manages to leap into the car, closing the door seconds before a huge lion crashes into the vehicle. The bloodthirsty animal is furious as it searches for a way to get inside and the family hunkers down with no idea if they'll survive. That's when the lion sticks its paw through an open window and the creature is determined to murder them, latching its claws into the father as it tries to drag him out. The man yells at his daughter to take the wheel and the girl steps on the gas, driving away as fast as she can. Nate manages to kick the animal off, but as they speed away, the car ends up crashing straight into a tree. Shaken up, he makes sure his kids are okay and helps them calm down before looking out the window, but finds no sign of the lion in sight. It seems like they're safe and he gets into the driver's seat trying to start the car, but it doesn't work. The engine must have broken down and the older sister starts to panic. This part of the reserve is closed off to the public and they can't contact anyone on the radio. It's clear that nobody is coming to help, but that's when they hear Martin call out to them on a walkie-talkie. The ranger tells them that the lion attacked him, mauling his leg so viciously that he can't stand up and he's losing blood fast. The father doesn't know what to do and explains that the truck is dead, so the friend suggests the family stay where they are until help arrives, but something's wrong. The ranger is feeling dizzier by the second and the father tells them that there's only one way to stop the bleeding. He instructs the man to heat up his knife and cauterize the wound. His screams of pain can be heard all the way from the car and the father tells his friend he'll come to find him, but the ranger insists that it's too dangerous. The lion has returned and to make matters worse, it seems like it's using him as bait. Okay, this is turning into a disaster. So far, almost every single decision the group made has been the wrong one, and now their car is broken, the ranger is critically injured, and they're at least 50 kilometers away from anyone who can help. It's not looking good, and it's clear that none of them are built to win this fight. The average lion can run up to 50 miles per hour and leap as far as 36 feet. The current road record for an Olympic long jump is 29 feet, and Usain Bolt, the fastest human on the planet, maxes out at 27 miles per hour. Even if you made a superhuman athlete with both of these abilities, they would not be able to avoid getting mauled to death by this lion, and that means our only solution is to outsmart it. Right now, these survivors are failing at this completely because they keep leaving the vehicle with no plan whatsoever. We have to remember that this beast is not an ordinary lion because there's no reason to keep Martin here alive unless he doesn't consider him a threat or has the intelligence to use him as bait. This kind of behavior is unheard of, and if it's true, then they're already playing right into the lion's paws. The good good news is that there still might be one thing they can do without constantly putting themselves at risk. If you look here, you can see that there are six jerry cans of gasoline on top of the truck, and since the engine is already broken, it's safe to assume it won't be useful for transportation anymore. A huge advantage this lion has over us is that it can hide in the environment and you'll never see it coming. That's why if I were in this situation, I would seriously consider pouring these gasoline canisters across the field and light it on fire. It sounds risky, but this might actually be the best idea they have at the moment, because the smoke will rise high enough to alert other rangers in the park and they'll come to investigate. It also has the added advantage of driving the lion out of the burning thickets or tall grass and we would be able to keep our eyes on him at all times. It's also worth mentioning that they're able to communicate with Martin through the walkie-talkie who would confirm that he's near a body of water so if the flames spread in his direction he'd be able to protect himself. Now it's a common misconception that lions are afraid of fire and that's been encouraged from Disney movies as well but the truth is many lions will actually approach a fire as it might be driving prey in their direction. With this in mind, we can keep the beast away from Martin and lure it closer to the road so that when rescue comes, the rangers will be able to kill it more easily without having to walk into the lion's trap. The father insists that he won't leave his friend behind, and that's when his daughter remembers there's a tranquilizer gun in the car. Searching the trunk, they find a locked box and break it open, finding a bag holding all the pieces of a rifle. He begins putting it together and tells his friend that he's found the dark gun. If they manage to shoot the lion with it, they should have time to rescue him, but the ranger warns the dad to stay with the car. The lion has wandered off, and he has no idea where it is. Nate realizes the beast might be nearby and takes his suggestion, but makes it clear he'll do whatever it takes to rescue his friend. Thinking quickly, he takes the assembled gun and climbs onto the car's roof, but has no idea what he's looking for. The father doesn't spot the lion anywhere, and it seems like they might be safe, but that was their biggest mistake. He asks Martin if there are any landmarks near him, and the 
ranger notices that there's a hunter's blind close by. Searching desperately, the kids discover the blind and point out where it is, but that's when the older sister decides to get out of the car. She runs off, telling the others she's going to save the ranger, but suddenly her little sister spots the lion prowling right behind them. Panicking, the father fires at the beast, but his first shot misses. He tries to reload as fast as possible, but the lion leaps towards him and knocks the man off the car. Spotting the animal getting closer, he crawls under the vehicle and avoids getting torn to shreds, but now he's stuck. The lion won't stop trying to attack him and refuses to give up. Circling around the car, it tries grabbing the man from the other side, but the animal can't reach him. Getting frustrated, the creature decides to leave the dad alone, giving Nate the opportunity to grab the rifle, but the lion suddenly turns back around and lunges for him. He's completely overpowered, but that's when the daughter leans out the window and jabs a tranquilizer dart straight into the animal. Lethargic, the lion stumbles away and leaves the humans alone, but that's not the last they'll see of him. Nate crawls out from under the car and makes sure the animal is far enough away before contacting his older daughter on the radio. The girl tells them she's safe and is already heading back with the ranger. Making it to the car, they get the man inside and treat his wounds the best they can. He'll need to be taken to a hospital, but that's when Mayor looks out the window and sees something horrifying. The lion has come back for them and the tranquilizer is already wearing off, leaving the survivors trapped with no way to escape. Okay, at this point, nobody should still be alive. First of all, getting on top of the car might seem like the right thing to do, but it's actually a horrible decision. As I mentioned earlier, lions can leap a full 36 feet, and that means this guy is not safe. It would have been much smarter to stand up inside of the car so that if the lion starts running at you, it's possible to duck back inside and close the metal gate before he reaches us. Now, the most terrifying thing about this situation is that the lion came from this mountain ridge right here. This creature literally flanked them from behind, patiently going around to make sure he had the advantage. The amount of intelligence required to use this strategy is seriously impressive, and it's also not how a normal lion hunts at all. Usually, these animals will lie low in tall grass and inch closer to their prey until it sees them, but this beast did the exact opposite. This creature is hunting down humans with their own tactics, and that means from this point on, we need to stop thinking of this thing like it's a lion, or it will get us killed. Now, even though the beast caught them by surprise, Nate actually managed to get a shot off in time, but he made one serious mistake. Wasting your ammo is the last thing you want to do in a situation like this, and that's why if it were me, I would have waited until the beast was much closer before taking the shot. Even if you've never fired a gun before and are terrified, it's obvious that missing the shot is going to be a fatal mistake. There's a lot of risk that something is going to go wrong, and anyone in their right mind would have waited until it had reached the car. If he had shot the gun at this moment and ducked back inside as the animal jumped, he would have guaranteed a hit while being protected. Having said that, I can't blame anyone for deciding to stay in the car and wait until we're found. From what we can tell, there are fewer rangers in this park than there should be, so it's a lot more likely that the first people to find us could be poachers. As scary as that might sound, it could actually be a good thing because right now we have the same goal. I want to kill this beast just as much as they do, and if rangers show up here with their puny tranquilizer guns, this beast is going to walk it off and tear them all to shreds. We need an army with real firepower to take this thing down, so that's why if it were me, I might decide to wait until night with my headlights on and hope I get found. The sad thing is that Martin would probably die, but in a situation like this, we have to cut our losses. It's a lot more likely all of us will get killed for trying to save one man, and as a father, I wouldn't be willing to take that risk. That night, the older sister tries calling for help over the radio, but there's no response. They don't know where the animal is hiding and have no choice but to hope someone finds them. Later, the ranger wakes up and asks the man what happened to the lion. The father tells him they last saw it wandering around the area, but they don't know where it is now. It's strange behavior for a lion, and Martin here suggests he knows why. Poachers must have killed the rest of its pride, and now it's adapted to hunt down any human it sees to get revenge. It's the deadliest animal he's ever encountered, and the man makes it clear their best chance of survival is to stay inside and wait for help. Later that night, the father wakes up and apologizes to his daughter for not being around when her mother was sick. It's a heartfelt moment, but the conversation is interrupted when they hear a voice on the radio. She thinks it must be a search party and they're finally going to be rescued, but that's when they spot headlights in the distance. A group of people are heading their way, and one of the girls notices that they have guns. These must be poachers, but with no other sign of rescue, the father walks outside to talk. He tells them that his family needs help getting back to town after they were attacked by a lion. The poachers realize it's the same beast that had attacked their men last night, and this hunter offers to take them to the village in exchange for money. Agreeing to pay, the father accepts the deal, and with that settled, the poacher opens the door to see who's inside the car. That's when he recognizes the ranger, and it makes 
attacks the man furious. He immediately pulls a gun on the father and reveals that Martin killed several of his hunters in the past. The situation is getting out of control, and the father insists they calm down, but then he sees one of the poachers dragging his daughter out of the vehicle. He tries to stop them, but gets pistol whipped and drops to the ground. Recovering from his fall, he begs them to leave his kids alone, but suddenly the lion comes pouncing out of the darkness and tackles a man. Everyone starts panicking, and the girl runs for her dad. They've both managed to survive, and he leads her back to the car as the poachers start shooting at the beast. Nate makes sure everyone is safe and tells them he's got a plan. He's going to steal the poacher's truck so they can escape, but the others need to be ready to move. Quickly heading for one of the vehicles, he opens the door of the closest truck, but discovers a problem. The keys aren't in the ignition, and the driver must have taken them, but he's nowhere in sight. Frustrated, the man heads back to his car and tells the others he'll need to find the keys, with no choice but to walk into the darkness where the lion is hunting everyone down. Okay, these people were not thinking clearly. Earlier, the two girls asked if Martin had killed any poachers on the job, and the man gave a really evasive answer. With that said, it's clear that there's bad blood between them, and if these poachers spot the ranger, then the situation might escalate quickly. The truth is, it's not uncommon for a ranger to kill poachers, but not for the reason that you think. One of the biggest factors at play here is that the punishment in South Africa for poaching is a 25-year prison sentence. Considering that the United States States has a two-year prison sentence for the same crime, this is a heavy price to pay. If a poacher gets caught by a ranger, nobody wants to risk spending that much time locked behind bars, so the confrontation often ends in a shootout. It's very likely that Martin here killed hunters out of self-defense, and that's why we have to make sure these poachers never see his face. The good news is that the man is already injured and bleeding, so if it were me, I would wrap his head in bandages, pretending that his face has been mauled. Now, offering the group $5,000 dollars for a ride was obviously the right decision, but the problem is that they'll want to hunt the lion first before leaving. They're already out here searching for it, but have no idea how dangerous it is, and if we don't convince them to leave now, it's very possible the beast might kill them all. That's why I would have lied, telling the poachers we've already contacted another ranger, and he's still on the way. This puts pressure on the poachers to accept our deal and leave, because if they stay to hunt the lion, the chances are they'll get caught. $5,000 for a car ride is the easiest money they'll make all night, and it increases our chances of escaping the park as quickly as possible. As for Nate here, walking outside with no weapon was a terrible idea. Even with guns, this beast is already butchering the poachers, and if we don't bring something to either arm ourselves with or use as a distraction, then we're as good as dead. The problem is that our tranquilizer gun is almost out of ammo, and the only weapon left is a small knife. We need something long range that can stop the beast in its tracks, and that's why if it were me, I would have brought Mare's camera. Lions have excellent night vision and can see up to 18 times better in the dark than humans. One of the reasons is that they have a lot more rod cells than we do, and that means their pupils can expand massively to let in as much light as possible. This makes them extremely sensitive to light, and with that in mind, I would use Mare's camera and take a photo, using the flash to blind the lion as a distraction. If the animal was running towards us, this would temporarily stop the beast in its tracks and give us a enough time to run back to the truck before it gets its sight back. Now, there's a chance the animal might recover faster than we expect, but even if it catches up to you, at least they'll have a great picture to show at your funeral. With the plan set, Nate heads out into the bush and discovers a dead body on the ground. Checking his pockets, he doesn't find the car keys, but hears gunfire in the distance and follows the sound. The man continues walking through the darkness when he notices the lion prowling nearby. The beast could kill him in a matter of seconds, and he hides behind a tree as quickly as possible. Suddenly, his daughter calls him on the walkie-talkie to check if he's okay, and the man drops it on the ground, stomping on the device to shut it up. But it's too late. The lion has heard it and is coming straight for him. The girls have no idea what's happening, but then they hear the animal growl into the speaker. The beast has found their father's radio, but has no idea that the man has climbed into the tree and is hiding right above him. That's when a snake appears in front of him and lunges forward, but he catches it at the last second. Thinking quickly, he drops it onto the lion below, sending the animal running in a panic. Seizing his opportunity, the man tries to make it back to the the car and crosses the river, but suddenly notices the lion in the distance. He quickly hides under a fallen tree branch and stands still as the beast searches for its prey. It knows something is nearby, but that's when the animal hears a honking car and leaves to investigate the sound. With the predator gone, the father gets out of the water and finds the body of a poacher on the shore. Searching him, he finds the keys to the truck and contacts his daughters, telling them he'll be back soon, but someone is going to die before he can get there.
there. Meanwhile, the others are still in the car when the line presses on the windows, trying to break into the vehicle. Martin tells the girls to get into the driver's seat, making it clear to avoid eye contact, and she quickly follows his orders. It's her best chance for survival, and luckily, the animal walks away. They think the coast is clear, but that's when the line suddenly charges at the vehicle and shoves its head through the window, trying to bite her. Terrified, Mare struggles to push the animal away, and the ranger warns them to escape before the vehicle tips over. The sisters climb out of the car as fast as they can, and moments later, the Land Rover falls off the cliff. It's sent tumbling to the ground below, but it's not over yet. The lion has survived and gets back up, limping away to search for its next victim. Turning around, it finds the ranger trapped inside the wreckage, and there's no way he can save himself. But Martin realizes the fuel tank is leaking. This gives him a clever idea, and as the animal pushes its way into the car, the man quickly flicks his lighter on. The gasoline goes up in flames, and he burns to death in an instant, but it won't be enough to put down this bloodthirsty lion. Okay, this was a wasted opportunity. Martin had a great idea to hold the lion inside as the vehicle was falling off the cliff, but the problem is he figured it out way too late. If you look here, you can see that as long as the car was kept in neutral, it wouldn't be that difficult for the girls to push this thing off the edge. And that's why if it were me, I would strongly consider luring the lion inside as a trap. We already know this beast will stop at nothing to attack a human, so we can depend on it to charge when it sees the survivors inside. With this in mind, I would swing open the front doors and keep the trunk doors ajar. If the plan works, the lion will charge into the vehicle, and as soon as it enters, we jump out the back and close the doors. His size will make it difficult to turn himself around, and it gives us an opportunity to push the vehicle off of the cliff, with the lion trapped inside. It's definitely risky, but so is staying in the car. As we just pointed out, the vehicle is already hanging dangerously close to the edge, and right now we can choose to either trap the lion or trap ourselves. If you look at it this way, way, the strategy is a no-brainer, and if we aren't using our best opportunities to escape this situation, then we're not going to survive. Now, they had another opportunity that they should have taken advantage of a lot more strategically, and it all comes down to this walkie-talkie. As we just saw, the lion was attracted to the noise, and it forced Nate here to climb into a tree, abandoning his only way to communicate with the others. He did a great job reacting to the situation, but if they were thinking clearly, they should have considered using this from the beginning. Nate needs to search for every dead body and find the keys to the vehicle, but the man has no idea where the lion is going to be. A situation like this makes it clear they need a method of distraction, and this walkie-talkie is the perfect tool. If it were me, I would tell my daughters to wait for three minutes, and then start screaming into the radio, while I set it down in a field and move in the opposite direction. If the plan works, the lion will be attracted to the noise, and it gives us the freedom we need to search for bodies, without worrying about running into the lion. It also gives us the opportunity to grab the poacher's guns, and since we know where the lion is going to be, we might be able to run back and pump the beast full of bullets before he realizes it's a trap. Meanwhile, the father heads back to the crash site when he hears an explosion in the distance. Worried, he runs straight for the truck and finds out his friend's vehicle rolled off the cliff, but there's another problem. His daughter has been injured by the lion, and after taking a look at her wound, he reassures the girl she'll be okay. Nate instructs her to keep pressure on the cuts and walks away to check out the explosion, but quickly realizes that his friend is dead. The family is on their own, and Nate will do everything he can to save his daughters from the vengeful lion. The next morning, they followed the road back from the crash site, hoping they'll get help, but the situation isn't looking good. The older sister needs medical attention as soon as possible, and they don't have enough fuel to get back to town. That's when the other sister spots the pride of lions they saw yesterday and reminds them that there should be an old school nearby. They might be able to find some supplies there, and the man stops the truck on the road, telling his daughters they should go check it out. Leaving the car behind. They make their way into the building and find no one inside. The man puts his daughter on a table to inspect her wound, but he needs to wrap it up, so they look for anything they can use to treat it. Luckily, the father manages to find medical supplies and alcohol that's been left over. Heading back to the table, he pours the booze over his daughter's cut to disinfect it, reassuring the girl that she's going to be okay. The man wraps up the cuts the best he can and tells Nora to keep watch over her sister while he goes to look for water. Heading outside, Nate enters another building and discovers covers a phone, but when he holds it up to his ear, there's no dial tone. The line is dead, and the man doesn't notice that the beast is prowling outside. That's when the daughters see the animal coming into the building and quickly get back to their feet. They sneak away as quietly as they can and take cover behind a desk before it spots them, but now they're trapped. Meanwhile, their dad has found a walkie-talkie and tries to contact help when he hears his daughters calling for him. He runs back to the other building and fires his gun, scaring the animal away until there are no bullets left. They're defenseless 
Paris, but he quickly gathers his children and leads them out of there. Crossing the yard, they find another place to hide and enter a classroom where they'll be safe. The man quickly closes the entrances into the building, but knows they can't keep on running. He explains to his kids that they have to split up, and while he will lead the lion away to lure it into a trap, they have to stay here to survive. The father has no choice but to handle it alone and leaves the building, closing the gate shut. That's when they notice the lion has returned, and the father pulls out his knife, doing everything he can to catch its attention. Once he's certain the animal is only focused on him, he runs from the school with the king of beasts chasing after him. The man heads all the way to the rocks where the pride is and faces off against the lion. They get into a brutal fight that leaves him severely wounded, but he won't last much longer. The beast is too powerful and tackles him to the ground, but before it can deliver the finishing blow, another lion steps in. Nate's plan to lure the other lions to attack it works, and they finish off the rogue animal as he crawls away. The father is on his last legs, but just as he's about to pass out, he hears vehicles in the distance and knows help has finally arrived. Later that day, he wakes up in the hospital and sees his daughters waiting by his bedside. They explain that the ranger Banji came to their rescue and brought them here. They're thankful they all managed to survive and have learned a valuable lesson from their safari adventure. If you f*** with nature, it will f*** you right back. But what do you think? How would you be beast? Let me know with a comment down below. Thank you so much for watching, leave a like and subscribe, and check out the How To Be playlist for more videos like this. Until next time, have a damn good day.